United Against Cancer. important like you said the voices of patients and um, recently the last world health assembly we saw the world health assembly pass a resolution about having more inclusion so it's great to know that countries like australia have caught on to this even earlier and also of course fantastic that a, a body like the wha is now making it a, a resolution and so more people will come onto that uh, network and be able to impact more uh, do you would you say that the patient voices are actually being included in policies in Australia and uh, what kind of recent changes have you had in policy to do with breast cancer that has impacted the lives of patients either positively or negatively let's let's hear a bit about those policies that you work with yeah it's a really good question and I believe that we there is real appetite and investment um, from our government, but also from the sector to really ensure that lived experience is, is part of the narrative, but also part of policy reform. And we're starting to see that within, um, and for a long time, Cancer Australia, who's our cancer control agency within Australia, has worked really hard to build about the consumer voice across our building out what is now our very um, first ever Australian cancer plan. So consumers, and if you like, uh, we call them um, consumers, those that we work with at Breast Cancer yes. Network Australia, <laughs> uh, our advocates within Australia really work towards ensuring that they have that voice to inform policy. And so one of the examples that I could share with you was a breast cancer report that we led um, at Breast Cancer Network Australia, which was around the access to breast reconstruction following a breast cancer diagnosis. And what we saw was that uh, those people who completed our survey and were part of our research worked with us that then led to the development of a collaborative group between the surgical uh, college, the Plastic Surgeon College, and also the Consumer Voice, which is Breast Cancer Network Australia. And we've created this collaborative group that is now working together to really advocate for access to breast reconstruction following a breast cancer diagnosis. And so really it's translating those activities and that research into real advocacy that is will inform policy. So we're looking to develop a position statement. We're in the process of that project at the moment to really see women at high risk who are wanting to have a prophylactic mastectomy to prevent or, if you like, to reduce their risk of getting breast cancer, get access to doing that. So um, we're in that process at the moment, but we have a number of examples where, um, like I'd mentioned, the breast cancer work that we did around the metastatic roadmap. So building out um, when people with metastatic breast cancer weren't being counted in our ca cancer registries, uh, they worked with us to advocate and build about a roadmap with the sector to inform um, policy changes to the way that we collect and collate staging and recurrence data for breast cancer. And as a result, uh, we're starting to see the implementation of a new data framework within our country, but also the way that we collect this data. So there are many examples that we're starting to see um, really shape policy reform and have done for many years. That's how BCNA started from consumers and their voices um, advocating for change back in uh, 26 years ago. And, and the Pink Lady was um, this organisation starting from those voices. And there have been many achievements to access to medications, access to Herceptin, which was a drug that really paved the way in Australia. And that was driven 
um, by this organization many, many years ago. So um, it is it is at the heart of what we do, but certainly, you know, well recognized within Australia now that co-design, co-participation, and informing policy related to um, disease um, is it, it pivotal to have that consumer lens and lived experience at the table. Thank you. Um, the, what the thing I was going to ask about the pink lady and the flags. What how, what does that stand for? Can you explain? Oh, so this, this is this is reflective of our organisation. Um, the pink lady is a symbol of people affected by breast cancer. It was founded. 26 years ago um, and so now we're looking to ensure that um, those people affected by breast cancer and we have um, behind me I don't know if you can see behind me there we've got the little blue man we know that men with oh, breast yes. cancer yes. are affected um, our two yeah. flags um, so our Australian flag there and also our um, Aboriginal flag our First Nations flag is in the background as well <laughs> Um, that reflects, um, you know, our country, but also our organisation being Breast Cancer Network Australia and representing all those affected oh, by affected. breast cancer. So, yeah. 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 That's yeah. it. So interesting. That's very interesting. And, and um, I was looking on your LinkedIn profile and one of your posts talked about uh, the problems that a lady that had breast cancer face navigating the system. You, I mean, you mentioned several stories and alluded to something like that. How, how is it? We think that over here, because we're, you know, navigation can be a problem. Awareness is so poor that even the uh, little in policies and, uh, you know, should I say programs that are available for cancer patients, for, including metastatic ones to access are not widely known about. So it's um it struck me that this is not something that uh, only low income countries face, uh, even in a system whereby there are uh, facilities available and you have uh, the solutions for cancer. It can be difficult navigating the system. How has uh, the network and the sixty organisations that you uh, speak about? How have you found uh, your patients? To, how easy or how difficult it is to navigate the system and why you highlighted that story in particular yeah it's really in it's a really important uh discussion and something that has been on the agenda in australia and is of of great interest uh there's been investment by our government uh to a number of not-for-profit um, organisations and organisations like us to really help with navigation and support that sits um, outside of what is the traditional hospital healthcare system, but supports the healthcare system. Because we know that someone that's diagnosed with cancer, not just breast cancer, navigates the complexities from early diagnosis right through the trajectory, if you like, of treatments and side effects. And they might be in the system in uh, having acute care treatment, but then long, uh, you know, uh, outside of that, they then um, are trying to work to come back into the workforce. If they're looking to come back to work after treatment yeah. or during treatment, how do they remain well living with a diagnosis for those mm. with metastatic Breast cancer, we know people are living a lot longer with metastatic breast cancer, with the with access to treatments that they can get uh, within mm -hmm. Australia. But also people with early breast cancer, um, you know, are looking for services and the ability to help them live well, you know, mm -hmm. beyond their treatment when they're finished treatment for early breast cancer. So it's in that area of supportive care that's often um, not available within the health system or, mm. or might because the health system is under pressure or also because it might only be available in certain hospitals in certain regions mm. of Australia, mm. but also um, it might be during that time when they're having their treatment, but then well beyond that, they might be looking for mm. those services to help mm. them live well. Um, yes you know, with and beyond breast cancer. So I think that that's the role that 
um, organisations like us can play, but also to ha having to navigate private versus the public health system, um, waiting times, access to clinical trials. Um, it can be it can be very overwhelming, and people tell us that that you know it's often very difficult to navigate and. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's a real investment to try and see the sector coming together to help support that. So thank you for that. Uh, as I mentioned, I am a board member of the Union for International Cancer Control, the UICC, and it's a global body that has different uh, partnerships uh, within Europe, outside, globally, actually. So you mentioned that you, you have um, partnerships with organizations like that, including the UICC. So if we zone down to that particular partnership and the collaborations that you've had over the years, how would you say um, it uh, it's affects your work, it helps or doesn't help your work, and also the importance of having partnerships both within country and out of country. Oh, it's such a great, great question. Um, partnerships are pivotal. I mean, you can't achieve what you achieve without partnerships, whether they're through lived experience or whether they're uh, through state-based and charity organisations, whether they're through help the relationships that you have with health professionals uh, that give their career and their life to, to improving the lives of people with cancer. But then also our global, uh, the UICC, the ABC Global Alliance, because it's how we all come together, um, understand those learnings, understand um, where the efforts need to be placed and where those unmet needs are and where we can really um, inform and improve the lives of people living with disease. And I think, you know, if ever there was a time, and I think certainly after what we've experienced over the last few years, you know, partnerships are pivotal. And uh, we, we have that opportunity now through things like this, this digital world that we live in to absolutely come together and connect from around the world as we um, understand the latest research and evidence um, to inform guidelines and, and really share those guidelines from around the world. And I think, um, yeah, we're, those partnerships are pivotal. So that's our position. And we'll continue to endeavour to, to work with our partners to, to see that come to life. Thank you so much, Vicky, for sharing a little bit about the work that you're doing, very important in Australia and uh, globally informing policies, working with patients, amplifying lived experiences for breast cancer patients, both early and metastatic, your alliances with global organizations, the impacts that the sharing the work that is going on and the data, more importantly, in Australia on the Lancet uh, Commission for Breast Cancer has had and how you tie all these together all towards one goal to having better outcomes for patients living with breast cancer, wherever they are, whatever their race, geographical location, ethnicity, and so on. And the importance of really, really amplifying uh, that lived experience. I thank you so much for your time this morning. And I hope that we will all be impacted by it and it will push us to do better. Thank you, Vicky. Before I go, I'm going to ask you to say United Against Cancer, because really, I think of all the interviews we've had, this has been uh, an epitome of how it is so necessary to unite the voice, the patients, and the opportunities that we have to improve the outcomes. We really need to unite it. So I want you to say United Against Cancer. United Against Cancer, and thank you for all that you do because I think it's just you do incredible work and um, we can only do it together in partnership. So thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.